we are looking at the three implications of the doctrine of revelation in bibliology, the study of scripture. The first of these was that there must be something to reveal. There must be some need for revelation. And this has gotten us into the area of the transcendence of God, which we have taken, I think, uh, six opportunities to teach on. Transcendent speaks of his otherness or his distance. God is other than what we are. He's not wholly other than, or that denies the fact that man's created in the image of God. He is distant, but he's not infinitely distant from us. There'd be no way to bridge that gap. The second implication of revelation is that in order for revelation to take place, then this transcendence somehow must be overcome, as it were. Now, that's overcome in quotation marks. In other words, there has to be some possibility of God communicating with us. He's God and he's not man, and we're men and we're not God. So in order for revelation to take place, it first of all implies that there's a need for something to be revealed to us that we can't get our hands on otherwise in any other manner or fashion. Well, all right, so there are some things, there are many things. There's God, his being, his person himself, and the various attributes of God, and his plan for the ages, his plan for our life minutely and personally, and his plan broadly for this whole world and for right down to the end of time. So how are we ever going to find out about that? If God's transcendent, then he is, he is far removed from us, he is high above us, he's distant, he's elevated. Well, the only, uh, the only way that, that God can reveal himself to us, seeing his transcendence, is that transcendence somehow must be overcome, as it were. It must somehow, that gap between us and God must somehow be bridged. In other words, God must break out of this otherness or this distance and somehow uh, speak to us. So that brings us then to the twin doctrine, the doctrine of God's imminence, this nearness or this coming close to us is what we refer to as God's imminence, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-C-E. If we could start tonight over in the book of Exodus and the experiences of Moses, I think we'll see how both of these are seen there. First of all, in Exodus chapter 33, verses 17 through 23. Eminence is what, quote, overcomes, end of quote, God's transcendence. Of course, nothing overcomes it because his transcendence remains intact, but God is both transcendent and eminent at the same time. It's one and the same person, God himself, who's both transcendent and eminent. Exodus 33, 17 through 23, the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. That's, of course, what Paul is quoting over in his epistle to the Romans. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and <clears throat> thou shalt stand upon a rock. And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by him, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. And then if you jump down into the fifth verse of the next chapter. The Lord descended in the cloud, and st so he descended, his transcendence. Now he's coming out of that. He's somehow breaking out of that, and he has to in order to communicate with us. And stood with him, Moses there, and proclaimed his name, the name of Yahweh. The Lord passed before him, Moses. Now, if this is an eminence, I don't know what it is. <laughs> this is the nearness of God. He came down in a bodily way, a theophany in the Old Testament, where God himself appeared to this man, his prophet Moses. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed Yahweh, Yahweh, Elohim, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy with thousands. This is the voice of God talking, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, that is, for those who repent and confess, will by no means clear the guilty, that is, the impenitent of heart, as Paul speaks in Romans 2, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third 
and to the fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. And also in chapter 24, verses 9, 10, and 11. We won't take the time to look that up. Chapter 24, verses 9 through 11, because we have plenty of scriptures we need to look at before we're through tonight. But I guess verse 5, you have it all summed up in a verse. The Lord descended. You descend from one place to another. That means you were transcend it now you become imminent well i guess really we've already begun the study of imminence last time because as soon as you attempt to refute errors of transcendence which are errors of absolute transcendence what do you have to do you have to teach imminence and we'll see before we're through that in order to refute errors of absolute imminence you have to teach transcendence whenever you teach one you're bound to teach the other or you end up in error so the answer to all false theories about transcendence is imminence and the answer to all false theories about imminence is transcendence. You have to keep them together. It's one large circle. So what we mean by imminence is this. It has to do with God, with God being present in the world. With God being present in the world. We saw earlier how transcendence was a spatial metaphor of distance, uh, more specifically one of elevation, God's height, thus saith the high and lofty one who inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. Isaiah 57, 15, we've quoted that scripture several times. That is a spatial metaphor, and if we can think of God's transcendence as a spatial metaphor, I think that we can conceive of his imminence as another spatial metaphor, and it's, of course, the metaphor of nearness, N E A R. N -E -double -S, God's nearness. God is within the world. He is near to the world. He is near to those of us who are in the world. And he's near in different regards. He is equally near in one regard to every aspect of his creation. Because of who he is, he's God. But he is near in a special or in a spiritual sense, nearer, let me say, to his people with whom he has covenant. He is nearer to them than he is to the heathen with whom he is angry every day. Now, like transcendence, eminence that's taught in Scripture, as I have studied this doctrine out, seems to center on three foci, or three concepts. Let's go back before I jump into that and just review, because we've been doing a lot of triplets here in this study, not only in Revelation, the book, but here in theology as well. The doctrine of revelation in theology, in bibliology, has three implications. We've been looking at that. One of those is transcendence, and I have taught you earlier that if you try to say, well, what is trans? Well, it's God's height, it's his otherness, it's his distance, and all right, well, those are all spatial metaphors. So what are you saying whenever you say that, that God is high? We know literally that's really not what you're talking about because God is low as well. So what do you mean by high? I said it focused on three different areas or concepts. Number one, his superiority. We've got two whole tapes on this, by the way. Number two, his authority. And number three, his mysteriousness. And by the way, it's that last one that really gets us into this whole area of the doctrine of revelation. We'll get back to that one and spend most of our time there on God's mysteriousness. Now, his transcendence in these three areas is absolute. I want to say a few things that are a little bit deep right now, and then I'll get into some things that maybe are a little more practical or applicable, but deep for a moment. His transcendence in these three areas is absolute. Now, what I mean by this with regard to superiority, authority, and mysteriousness, what I mean by this is that they are absolutely above and beyond any possibility of successful challenge. They're absolute. 
they are above the possibility of any successful challenge. Now, I didn't say they're above being challenged because the wicked with his tongue walks to the earth and with a clenched fist has it raised toward heaven blaspheming God. But he's an ant and God's going to crush him one day. Sorry about the way that sounds, but that's Psalm 2. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish in a moment. Kiss is the word of relationship. You had better have a relationship with the son or you will perish in his anger. Now he is a gentle shepherd, but one day he will be a very accurate and fair and impartial judge. So it's beyond any successful challenge. He is God with all the attributes that such a being would possess. But this ontological absoluteness does not force him into the role of abstract principle. Now, you could put capital A and capital P for that last one because that's kind of where the heathen is. Well, God's kind of an abstract principle. Eastern religion, the deist, just your typical college professor. <laughs> God's an abstract principle. I said that it's ontological absoluteness. God is absolute. God is not abstract. God is personal. God is a living being. Abstract things are things like concepts. Three plus four, that's abstract. That's not personal. You don't get anything out of that except something abstract. God's ontological absoluteness, but he is absolute. Now, do you know what that phrase means, his ontological absoluteness? <laughs> don't shake your head at me. I don't know what it means. You're supposed to say, yeah, I know what it means, so we can go on and talk about other things. Well, ontology in Greek means the study of being. His ontological absoluteness. God in his being is the absolute being. And what we mean by that, it's just a big phrase to try to express all that you'd have to say if you try to express all of it. His ontological absoluteness. What we mean by that is God, uh, he, he owes his derivation to no one because he isn't derived. He has been here from eternity to eternity. All the things that go along with an absolute being. Not an abstract one, but absolute. You can be absolute and not abstract. And it's very important that you don't confuse the two terms, absolute and abstract. It's a popular non-Christian delusion that God is what? He's the great abstract principle. Well, God is not principle and God is not abstract. That's a, that's a very popular non-Christian doctrine and delusion. And they may even capitalize those two words, that God is the great abstract principle. Now, most unsaved people, I'll tell you why they don't use the term absolute, most unsaved people want nothing to do with absolutes. They're children of this theory called relativism. Everything is relative to time, space, who I am, my background, what's going on now, everything is relative. Things aren't relative with God. Truth is truth, a lie is a lie, the devil is a devil, and God is God. And never shall the twain meet. But unsaved people want nothing to do with absolutes, but if they must have it, it has to be an abstract absolute. Why? Because as long as it is an impersonal absolute, they don't even like absolutes, but don't dare put absolute along with personality. If, they're gonna, if you're going to make them, or if they're, if they're willing to accept for a moment some type of concept of absoluteness, like of God's absoluteness, it has to be an abstract absoluteness. I'll tell you why. Because an impersonal absolute can't make any demands on their life. As soon as you turn this business of abstraction into ontology, that God has being, therefore will, therefore personality, then you've got a scare on your hands. An absolute abstract has neither the power to bless nor to curse, and they're mostly concerned about the latter of those concepts. There are personal gods, quote-unquote, in paganism, but none are absolute. There are absolutes in paganism, but none are personal. Right? Right? You may have to listen to all that again. <laughs> Only with the Christian concept of a transcendent, eminent God do we have the personal absolute. I mean, that's what God is calling himself when he says, I am that I am. I am that I am the ground of being. But I'm more than that, I am being. God's not a principle called the ground of being. God is personality. And he is full of emotion and compassion. We'll get into that before we're through tonight. Although you've got personal gods in paganism, none are absolute. Although you have absolutes in paganism, none are personal. It's only with the Christian doctrine of a transcendent, eminent God that we have, it's only with this that we find that we have a personal absolute, and his name is God. Personalities have a name, and God, of course, has given himself various names, but the most general name is God. He is God, 
and as such he possesses all the attributes that such a being would possess. Two of those being transcendence and eminence both are relational attributes by which God stands in some relation, one distinct or, or separate from and the other near to his creation. So like transcendence, eminence as taught in scripture seems to center on three concepts. The nearness is not literally spatial for God because God, not being an object, has neither distance nor nearness as concepts that are applicable to him. First of all, one concept that eminence seems to center upon is God's awareness. God's awareness. Now, I'm trusting that we've done enough study on transcendence showing you that the word is a metaphor, and it's a spatial metaphor, and in order to get some type of meaning out of that, you've got to go beyond what is just metaphorical and find out what is it concrete that we're talking about. I'm going to be doing the same now. We could say that God's eminence is nearness. Well, what have you said when you've said that? Because God also dwells in the high and holy place. He inhabits eternity. But we know that he's near. Well, what does his nearness express? Well, as I study this out, I would say it focuses on three basic scriptural concepts. And the first of those is God's awareness. Awareness. Now, awareness speaks of personality. You'll notice that all of these things... See, transcendence to some people speaks of non-personality. Eminence, or God's nearness, does speak of personality. He's not the abstract being of the Hindus. He's not the abstract being. Now, he's an absolute being, but not the abstract being of deism, who is so high above the earth that he could not possibly be aware of the earth state. But by his eminence, he is completely aware of the universe's smallest details. Now, such a thought is both frightening and comforting. Such a thought is both frightening and comforting. More comforting to those of us who are believers than frightening, and more frightening to the heathen than comforting. You ought to read in the first few chapters of Calvin's Institutes. Calvin starts off on the doctrine of the knowledge of God. He said it's the most basic thing to know ourselves and to know God, the sum of wisdom, and he has some of the, I would call him just plain funny, because he's a good writer and he thinks well, examples of the heathen and what he thinks whenever a clap of thunder, or we would say today a firecracker goes off behind him. He seems to be always on, on the edge of his seat, always on edge for fear, as though he knows that there is a being who is looking out after him with disapproving eyes. So I say it's troubling, it's very troubling, it's frightening to the heathen, it's comforting to us, but on times it might be troubling and frightening to us as well. How about some scriptures here? Matthew 10, 29, I think we've looked at that before. Matthew 10, 29. Job 31, 4. We'll take a look at Job 34, 21. Here we read, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Expresses God's awareness. He is aware. We're not always aware. Sometimes we are, sometimes we aren't. But God's awareness is an absolute one. We're not absolutely aware at any time, because all you could be aware of would be just a few things going on in the universe at the same time. And God is absolutely aware of everything going on at the same time. He's aware of the universe's most minute details. His eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Second Chronicles 16.9 is a comforting passage. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And he's looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. Second Chronicles 16, 9. I think I gave you before Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. His awareness. He is aware. Now, we don't have too much more than that said. We're going to build on this. We'll say, well, he's aware. What about that? Well, the <laughs> Bible goes on to say he's not just aware in some type of um, unconcerned, passive, um, temperamentally static state is more than aware, but we have to start with his awareness. 
Proverbs 5.21 also speaks of his awareness. Zechariah 4.10, these seven are the seven eyes of the Lord that run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Speaks of God's omnipresence, the fact that he is aware, literally, of every detail in the universe. Such a thought, I say, is both frightening and comforting. Zechariah 4.10. Or probably the classic Old Testament passage teaching this would be the 139th Psalm. If you turn there, we'll look at the first few verses. Psalm 139. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my fault afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, we could say, and above and beneath, and to the left and to the right, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Well, obviously, we, we would be God if we could. We can't attain unto that type of knowledge. God knows everything about us. He knows every word in our mouth, every word on our tongue, you, he understands our thoughts afar off. He doesn't even have to get close to us and pick up a vibration. He understands it afar off because he's God. So the psalmist asks, it's comforting to the psalmist now. He just, he's not writing from a negative perspective. Now, if you had sinned, then this would be a negative psalm here. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in the grave, behold, thou art there. Just a contrast of height and depth. Don't make something literal out of heaven and hell. If I take, it's poetry. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, then even the night shall be light about me. And look at verse 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. Remember last time we were reading how the heathen, he always is saying, well, who can see what I'm doing? He thinks that God dwells up in the height of the clouds and the darkness and he can't see. Well, the Bible says the darkness and the light are both alike unto God. His, his omnipresence, his vision, his ability to discern what's going on penetrates. It penetrates around the earth. It penetrates through the darkest cloud. It would penetrate right into those secret chambers of the imagery of someone's heart, Ezekiel chapter 8. He sees all of our sin. Now, this is the frightening side of it, Jeremiah 16, 17. Let's look at a few scriptures here. Jeremiah 16, 17. None of our sins escape God's attention, his awareness. Jeremiah 16, 17. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Jeremiah 32, 19. Great in counsel and mighty in work. He's saying this is what the Lord is. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And over in Hosea's prophecy, chapter 7 and verse 2, and they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. And he'll tell us why at the end of this verse. Now their own doings have beset them about. They are before my face. It's not just something he remembers because it's past. He said it's ever before me. His awareness. He is aware of everything. The smallest details, the largest details God is aware of. This is his eminence. In Psalm chapter 11 and verse 4, both his transcendence and his eminence are set together. We'll find a few of these passages. I'll give you some of the best ones another study but you can find some passages where they're both set together in one verse here here is one of those psalm 11 4 the lord is in his holy temple and where is that the lord's throne is in heaven that's his transcendence his eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men that's his eminence psalm 11 4 it's 
See, you've got his transcendence on one hand, his height above, his temple, his throne is in heaven, but his eyes behold and his eyelids try all of the works and thoughts, motives, and plans and deeds and actions of the children of men, his eminence. The same is true in chapter 33 and verse 13. And if you want a verse over the New Testament, probably the most powerful one in this regard is Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. God's awareness. This is a particularly good passage in the New Testament, Hebrews 4, 13. It, uh, it's a strong scripture. It's found in a comforting context, but uh, it's probably found in one that might not necessarily be that comforting when you look at verse 12 also. The word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That would include all of the thoughts and intents, both good and bad. And so on the basis of that, Paul says concerning God, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Remember how he found Adam and Eve hiding in the garden? Well, he said, well, where are you? But he knew where he was the whole time. God knows everything. All things are naked. All things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You couldn't hide in the thickest armor-plated tank from God. You couldn't. You couldn't hide from God. You couldn't dig into the deepest hole in hell and hide from God. That is, the center of the earth, as it were. Psalm 139, poetry. You couldn't hide from God. You couldn't hide in the grave. You couldn't hide in the height of heaven. We wouldn't expect that would be close to him, but you couldn't hide from anywhere, not in the depth of the sea, not 20 leagues under the sea. You couldn't hide from God. All things, because he's God, I'll say it again, God's not an object, so distance and nearness don't apply to him. He's not object. That only applies to material objects. Whatever you are, spirit, God is spirit, John 4, 23 and 24. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Whatever your spirit, then distance and nearness those are, those are ideas or concepts that relate to physical properties. Those don't relate to God. They don't apply to him. And so as things that do not apply to God, wherever we are, that's immaterial as far as God is concerned. He, he lives, dwells in another realm that is larger than the realm in which we live. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And I'd like to show you this in another very interesting way. A lot of the theologians don't really think of this side when they write some in this area. But I think that we see such awesome awareness in the earthly life of Jesus. His incarnation, I think, in itself was a special exhibit. That was like special exhibit A of the doctrine of God's eminence. He robed himself with flesh and he dwelt among us, as John tells us in the first chapter of his gospel. He tabernacled among us. But I'm thinking of some other ideas, like in Mark 2, verses 6 through 8. His incarnation was special exhibit A of the doctrine of God's eminence, that he's near man, so near that it frightened the people that Jesus was around. But not only is that true, he's near in the sense of his own discernment. In Mark 2, verses, well, first third or so of the chapter here, we have the case of him healing this lame man, but before he does that, he forgives him of his sins. He says in verse 5, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. We read in verse 6, But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Notice where the reasoning was done. Not, it was not some external discussion with literal words by these scribes. It was done in their hearts. Several of them had the same thought. They must have been brought up with the same religious ideas. Why did this man thus speak blasphemies? For who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately, remember that's one of Mark's favorite words, anon, forthwith, immediately, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within, not among, but within themselves, then he begins to say things that are pointed that deal exactly of what was going on in the very hidden chambers and recesses of their heart. By the Spirit, he perceived what was going on in their... Now, again, you could hardly ask for a better example of the eminence of God. How, how close... I mean, God could ask man, how close do you want me to get to prove to you my eminence? I can actually read the thoughts of your heart. 
We think of imminence as a physical type of concept. It's just a physical metaphor. It's a spatial metaphor. But it's not a physical type concept. It's a spiritual type concept. And God is so near. How, how near can you get? I can get close to you and I can't figure out a thing going on in your brain. But he can perceive the very thoughts of the heart. Now that's in his earthly life and of course God can do that now as well. Or another case in John 1, 47 to 49. There seems to be something about the word of knowledge. That's what this might be called as a spiritual gift anyway, the word of knowledge. In John 1, 47 to 49, he said, when you were by the fig tree, I saw you there. Well, I believe, again, this is a word of knowledge. Jesus didn't actually see him in a physical sense that he was right by him there. Or it would not have astounded the disciple as much as it did. So he said, I perceive that you're the king of Israel. Or in Luke chapter 7, verses 39 and 40, or really 39 and following, I think this is a case where Simon the Pharisee has Jesus over to dinner and a certain woman who's simply called by Luke a sinner. Now, we're not told what she did wrong, but she was a woman who was a sinner. Came, and from the time Jesus came in, she ceased not to weep and wash his feet with her hair, just pouring out her devotion and love. And what was old Simon there? He's a nice man, a Pharisee, invited Jesus over to dinner, and Jesus accepted the invitation. But what's Simon thinking in his heart? Do you remember the account there? Well, now, if this man were a prophet, he wouldn't, exceed that, he wouldn't receive that type of devotion from this person because he would know. See, he's saying if you're a prophet, he had a biblical belief here, you would be able to have discernment, word of knowledge, and you'd know this woman in her back without anyone telling, having to tell you. If you were a prophet... He wouldn't be accepting this because he knows what type of woman this is. Well, only problem was Jesus was a prophet and he knew not only that woman's background, but he knows what Simon is thinking. So he didn't think deeper enough to think, and if he is a prophet, he's also thinking what I'm thinking. He forgot about that. If he's a prophet, he knows not only this woman's background, but he knows my hypocritical reasoning I'm going through in my own mind. So, of course, Jesus pulls it on him and he starts telling him this little story about receiving someone in before you know it. You know how Jesus dealt with people? He's got this guy hooked by his own confession. He said, why, well, when I came in, you didn't give me any water for my feet. You didn't do anything for me. Those who are forgiven much love much. <laughs> I don't think Simon liked to hear that very much. Those who are forgiven much love much. Now, he might like the idea, well, at least that means I must not have committed too many sins. So I don't have to be forgiven very much. But it also means he doesn't love God very much either, though. Now, what would be your pick if you had a pick? I'd rather sin a lot and love a lot than sin a little and not love very much at all. Well, our Lord is penetrating in his wisdom and in his discernment. He knew exactly what's going on in their life. And you know, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He knows exactly what's going on in our mind, in our heart. Whenever we sit under the influence of his word and try to reason with that, he knows that. Even if we're not saying anything about it, he knows that we're reasoning over something. He knows that. It's so interesting how all of us can read the New Testament. We know all this is true, but yet we don't apply it to us. We're special exhibit number A as far as we are concerned. We are specimen number one as far as we are concerned. We think, we know, we believe because we've read in the New Testament that all these things are true and God hasn't changed. If anything, he's got more deserved, but now he was limited by a physical body then. And now he's the exalted, glorified Lord of heaven and earth. And if he could do that then, how much more can he write now? There he was bound by space and time due to the incarnation. Now Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, knows everything about everyone, all places, all people, all times, all occasions, all faults. How is he going to be able to judge us by our actions, by our words, and by our thoughts unless he knows things like that? Unless he is privy to such knowledge? And remember, we're told it's a high type knowledge. David said, that's high, that, that's so high knowledge, I cannot attain unto it. That's lofty knowledge there. But God does. God does. He has, he does, he will continue. God knows everything. God is aware. God is aware. Well, secondly tonight, a second concept that eminence focuses on is God's concern. Awareness alone, I don't think, would be enough. You see, in deism, 
D-E-I-S-M, you could have a God who is vaguely aware of mortal man's struggles, while at the same time being unconcerned. You could have a God in deism who's temperamentally static, who's passive, who's unconcerned, and although he is aware, he just lacks his concern that our God has. The scriptures tell us that God is deeply concerned about his creation. These are deep matters that we're teaching you on in these classes, studies, and theology. Sounds rather simple and basic, but they're deep. God is deeply concerned. I mean deeply concerned about you, about myself, about the heathen. He's deeply concerned. He's concerned about the rain, about the sunshine, He's not the God of the deists who just put this ball like you'd spin a top on a table, put it into motion and walked away from it. He is imminent. That means he is near to this world, near to his creation. He is present. He is present here in the world, in the universe. He's present through primary and secondary causes. That's another whole matter you'd study in theology under God's providence and Government, concurrence, preservation by primary and secondary causes, God is here. There's no such thing as just laws of nature that operate independently from God. Those are the very laws that God has established here. People talk about laws of nature that the scientists have figured out as though it's, you know, just something natural. And it has no um, focus in God or there's no relationship between God and what goes on in this world. I still say that's, that's probably one of the best signs of the heathen out there because they don't mind having an abstract principle. They might not even mind having an absolute one as long as he's not personal. Because when you have him become personal, then all of a sudden a personal being has the power to both bless and curse. And it's that last thing that they're afraid of. I think I've mentioned to you before, maybe before I even go on, I want to read this to you. I mentioned the last verse of Romans 1. People sometimes just think you're talking only from a Christian perspective. They say, oh, the heathen out there don't, they, you give them credit for too much. They don't really sit around thinking, they don't know anything. They, you better give them credit for what the Bible gives them credit for. Here's what the Bible says, Romans 1.32. Speaking of the heathen, gives a long list of almost two dozen marks of the heathen. They're filled with unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, and so forth. Who knowing the judgment of God? Now, I'll let you be the judge on this matter. Do the heathen know that God's going to judge them for their sins? That's what the scriptures say. Whether you think that's right or, or you think that maybe Young or Freud or someone might could test it and prove it to be wrong, no one can prove God wrong. No one can prove that God is wrong. You can ask a heathen and say, do you know God's going to judge you? And he'll say no. Then you can either call him a liar or God's book a lie. God's book says he knows the judgment of God, that it's eternal judgment. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things, fornication and all these things mentioned, they know that if you commit such things, you're worthy of death, and they not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. It's going to be a double judgment then. They're not dragged into it kicking and screaming. They say, Paul tells us they know the judgment of God, they know it, that they are worthy of death, and they still not only continue in these, but they continue in them with pleasure. And is God concerned about these people? You better believe that he is. He wouldn't be the God of Scripture if he is, and he's deeply concerned. And that, that he is deeply concerned with his creation is seen in the many emotive qualities ascribed to him. Take, for instance, Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6. Two precious verses. They've been meaningful to me for many, many years now. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. And when God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, when God saw that his, this is a pre-flood passage here, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, now what do we read in the next verse? It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it, are you there yet? What's that word? It grieved him. God experiences grief. The emotive, E-M-O-T-I-V-E, emotional, emotive qualities that God has. 
God's emotive qualities express his eminence with regard to the second concept, his concern. God was grieving over the wayfaring state of man. Grieving over man. He cannot get man to repent. He gave him 120 years under the influence of the preaching of this prophet Noah. God said, My spirit will not always strive with man, for that he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And Noah built, and Noah preached. And Noah built, and Noah preached. And Noah built, and Noah preached. It was the spirit of Christ, Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19, who was preaching through Noah to the spirits who were disobedient, who are now in Peter's day in prison, striving against them with the word and with righteousness and with truth. And did they respond? They did not. They did not. And so it grieved God at his heart that he had made man, he made him upright, Ecclesiastes 7.29, but man sought out his own inventions. He made him upright. He didn't make him a sinner. He made him Adam and Eve, who were innocent and who were righteous. The devil deceived them and it grieved God that man had to experience what he did. You see how there's a difference between awareness and concern. You might be aware. You often are. You're aware of the need in the body. You, set, you, you go into second gear when you become concerned. Then there's a third gear when you do something about it. You'll see all these three steps are involved in God's eminence. God is aware. Well, we could say, well, you might could be a God of deism and be vaguely aware. You're up there, and so you're somehow, but God's more than aware. He is passionately, if I can use that word, passionately concerned. We need to, I just don't think a lot of people see God the way they should in this, in this area. He is passionately concerned. It's because we're flesh and he's spirit, and he, and he is transcendent. He seems to be so far removed from us that people can't seem to get it in their mind. He is passionately concerned over our life and your neighbor's life, your mother's life and your father's life. He's not just disinterestedly aware of what's going on. He is passionately concerned. So concerned that he is doing what he can do to reach those people. By sending the rain, the sunshine, by a good birth or a good home, a good upbringing, by them uh, being allowed to hear the gospel, or by so many different ways. By not allowing every sickness to be a terminal one. He could just say, if you ever get sick, you just have to die. Well, most sicknesses aren't terminal, and you finally get over and So what should you do when you're a heathen and you get over a sickness? You ought to find a temple somewhere and go offer a sacrifice. Translated in today's terms, go into a church and bow your knee to Jesus Christ. But they don't. They just say, well, I was really lucky there. Now, I kicked the old C on that one. <laughs> well, that, the guy who said that died of that C that he thought he had kicked before. You either, you either ascribe good things to God or God's going to be looking up your number one day. Of course, you say, well, the heathen doesn't have the... He hasn't got plenty of opportunities to ascribe goodness to God. He's got plenty of opportunities. But what he does, what does he do? In his vain and foolish heart, his imaginations become darkened and he starts worshiping the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. He says, son, oh, yeah, the son, that is good, so I'll call you the son God. Well, you can't. Well, come on, there's God. Who made the sun up there? Sun couldn't have made itself. The rain, I love, so we'll have a rain God or a fish God. Or a, and you've perverted the wisdom that God intended for you to use. You can look out there and see cre creation and see nature, and you're supposed to say, now, there's a great God, Now I'm going to find out who that God is. You start searching for him, and he's going to reveal himself to you. I mean in a more personal, special, spiritual way than what you can just see through the awareness you have of nature. In Exodus 2, 23 to 25, this concerns God's covenant people, so these scriptures maybe wouldn't surprise us as much as, as those that are just speaking of mankind in general. Exodus 2, 23, 24, and 25. See, in all these teachings that we do, friends, I know this is repetitious, so I don't like to say it too often because I like to give you credit for more intelligence than that, for me to have to say something all the time. But you know how some churches are. You just have a little healing, glory, let's go to heaven message, prosperity, get a new Jaguar message or something every now and then. And, well, you have those messages all the time. And people don't ever grow. You hear things like this and... 
People say, well, it's theology or revelation. Why take 39 messages on nine verses? Well, you don't have to. You can do it some other way. You can teach one per chapter and be through in 22 weeks and still basically understand the outline of the book of Revelation. But I want to understand the book of Revelation just the way that it's written, with, with all the comments, just the way that it's written. And more than that, it gives us an opportunity. To, you know, people look at a long study and say, well, why so long? But they don't look at all that went into that which was so long. There are many things. We kind of fluctuate between something that's heavy on the cognitive side and something that's heavy on the emotional side. And that's just the way that it has to be. You grow as a complete being then. Well, Exodus 2.23, it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage. And they cried. And their cry came up to God by reason of the bondage. Came up to God, his transcendence. Came up to God by reason. Why? Well, God didn't just listen to cries, but it was a cry that came through their bondage of having to serve as slaves to the pharaohs in Egypt. And God was aware of the bondage they were in. He was aware of it. But more than that, he is very concerned. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. You know, that's just, that's just the first inkling we have to the whole story of the book of Exodus. That's just the first inkling. You know, the next chapter, now he's going to have respect. And what does he do? He goes and searches out a man. I've got to find a man who's going to lead these people out. And then we've got the whole book of Exodus set before us. Those three little verses are so important here. They set the whole scene for it. They've been down there for so many years. It was good while ever Joseph was alive. Whenever Joseph died, there arose a king that knew not Joseph in Israel. And so, uh-oh, what are we going to do right now? Well, the king just kind of takes over, and the people are oppressed, begin to multiply, and are then oppressed even more. And they cry out to God because of this bondage, and God, we're told he remembers the covenant, he looked upon them, and he had respect unto them, and he began to do something about it. Judges 10, 16, book of Judges, a very similar passage. I guess I could read it very quickly, but again, it's due to the oppression of their enemies, which is due to their sin. The children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee this day. Chapter 10, the book of Judges, if you flip over there. Chapter 10, verse 16, They put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Isaiah 63, 9 reads like this, In all their affliction, he was afflicted. How do you like that? For identity and solidarity. Isaiah 63, 9. In all their affliction, speaking of the nation of, of Israel, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Isaiah 63, 9 speaks of God's absolute passionate concern for the nation of Israel. In all their affliction, he was right there with them. Now, that's a, that's a pretty strong verse to balance this extreme idea of Carl Bard and company on transcendence. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. When you suffer, it's as though God suffers. Let Scripture just stand for what it says. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bare them and carried them. You know, like, like, the, like the young men would help the elderly or help the women with child or help the young children. He bare them and carried them all the days of old. He was watching out for them. Or take Luke 19, verses 41 and following. Why don't you turn over there? While you're turning there, let me just give you another scripture. We won't take the time to turn to it. Acts 9, 4. What did Jesus say whenever, with that blinding light, he appears to Saul on the way to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting the Christians? Is that what he says? No. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Me? You can't, you can't persecute Jesus. When you persecute his church, you're persecuting him. In all their affliction, he is afflicted. What's true for Israel in that regard is true for the Christian church. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? This is a faith message again in itself. Hey, whenever something touches you, something's touching God. 
The devil better leave you alone. He's touching God, and God's not going to take that very lightly or kindly. He is going to redeem you and set you free. He is concerned whenever you're in some bondage, and the devil is putting you... The devil is like Pharaoh in Egypt trying to put you in servitude and slavery. God's concerned about that. He's going to do something about that right away. He's going to be coming to your rescue. Whenever you're afflicted, he's afflicted. I like the way it says it there. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? We know that he was going into houses and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. He never did anything to Jesus. But you touch his church and you touch him. Now, Luke chapter 19. Now, this is one of the um, gospel accounts where Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. And this 41st verse is very interesting because or 42nd verse, I guess, is very interesting because part of it's never even finished. When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. Remember in Matthew's account, that must be Matthew, um, what is that, 23, I believe, the end of Matthew 23. He talks about how you've killed all the prophets sent to you, and I would, like a mother hen, gather you together. As she would gather her chicks, so would I you, but ye would not. Therefore your house is left unto you desolate, and you shall not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. This is Luke's account. When he beheld the city, he wept. Now this is Jesus weeping over. We see this is his nation. These are his people. You say, well, they're Pharisees and they're legalists. That's right, but they're still his people. God never forsakes his people. He'll never stop loving them. They are the very ones whom he, knows, whom he knows will crucify him. And he weeps over them with genuine sorrow. And he said, watch how this builds. This is a sentence filled with emotive qualities. If thou hadst known, even thou. Now he's emphasizing, I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm talking about you. If you had known, even you, at least in this thy day. All right, well, pardon the fact you didn't know it earlier, but now your Messiah is here. If you would at least had known in this your day the things which belong unto thy peace. Now, we know, we've studied English, have we not? If statements are supposed to be followed with then ones. If then, a protasis, a protasis. If you had known, then, well, it's like it's just left off. If you had, and it never finishes the then, but now they're hid from thine eyes. Because there is no then. Then's not a reality, because the if was not fulfilled. Now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and Titus, the Roman emperor in A.D. 66 to 70, did, and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side. And they shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. He said that concerning those big, huge, beautiful Herodian stones because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Paul tells us in Galatians 4 that he came, he was born of a woman under the law, and he came forth in the fullness of time. It was the appropriate time, a time appointed of the Father, Mark 1 says, for him to come forth. Because you knew not the time of your visitation, but still you see his great concern for the nation. You know, he's concerned enough that if they had just paid a little attention to some of the prophecies that were probably circulating in the early church, they would have known what to do. The early Christians did. He said, whenever you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, what do you tell them to do? Flee! Let him that's on the housetop not come down to get anything, but flee! The early Christians did. Christian Jews did flee whenever Titus surrounded the city. The Jews, you know how stubborn they are. They didn't flee from Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't flee before Titus. They said, we're going to stay and win. Of course, they didn't. They were massacred. The accounts, you read Josephus and other historians, somewhere in the order of more than a half million Jews, half million, 600,000 Jewish men, women, children, baby boys and girls were all slaughtered by Titus and the 10th legion of the Roman army. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, which we probably, most of us know by heart or no, by paraphrase anyway. This is just after the verse where we read earlier that all things are naked and open under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And he goes on to talk about this great high priest that we have. Verse 15, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our weaknesses, but was in all points 
tempted like as we are, yet without sin. In other words, the implication is he can be touched. He can be touched. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, have you used that in the last week? That's why it's there. It's not there just to study in theology class. Theology class is here so you can go out and do it. Right? Have you used that in the last week? I bet you've needed it. <laughs> Did you go and say, I need to go now to the throne of grace and obtain grace. Find some help here in time of need. That's what it's there for. It's there to read about and study and memorize so that you can go out and do it. It's not the hearers of the word, but the doers that are just in God's sight. Romans 2, 15 and 16. Well, tonight, if I've got time, let's go on to the third concept. Now you know, now you're concerned, now you put some feet to your concern, and I would call this activity. Awareness, first of all, concern. And thirdly, the doctrine of God's eminence focuses on God's activity. He's more than simply aware of the earth's state and concerned over it, but he's actually actively involved in it. He's personally present. This isn't just some type of abstract, let's set the laws of nature into motion. Don't you believe that for a moment? That's kind of deism. That's not biblical theology. He is personally present and active in the world by his spirit. He is personally present and active in the world by the Holy Spirit. For instance, the 104th Psalm, Psalm 104, verse 14. He causes the grass to grow. He causes. It's not some law of nature. He causes the grass to grow. Now, he can work through secondary causes, but he's still the one working. As soon as he stops working, there are no secondary causes. This world is held together by the word of Jesus' power, Hebrews 1 and Colossians 1. And he also makes the herb for the service of man. That's in verse 14. Verse 21 of this psalm, I believe, says something along the line of the young lions roar and they seek their prey from God. Or the familiar passage, Matthew 6, 26 and 30, the birds of the air, the lilies of the field, who takes care of them? God. He governs the weather for our good, Matthew 5, 45. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust. So you can't ask for him to rain on your garden, but don't rain on that heathen over there. Well, God loves the heathen over there. Well, he does, for God so loved the world that he sent his son into this world. Acts 14, 17 says the same thing. Now there, Paul, there's no question about the fact that he's talking about the heathen. There's a sense, let me go back and make sure you don't misunderstand me, there's a sense in which God loves the heathen and a sense in which they are despised by him. Acts 14, 17, gave us fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And he generously supplies the needs of his people. This is God's activity. He's concerned He's aware, he's concerned, and he's active. He generously supplies the needs of his people. What do you need? God is aware of that need. He's aware of it. Your father knoweth that you have need of such things. But he more than knows that he's concerned. He wants you to be able to have it. But he's more than concerned. He not only wants you to have it. I might want you to, but I might not have the power to help you, though. He has the power. He has not only the awareness, he has the concern, and he has the ability this is the thing about God, to do something about his concern. We might be aware and concerned and not be able to. Now, we might be, but we might not. But God has the ability to do. Matthew 6, 24 to 34 teaches us he has the ability to be active on our behalf. He has the ability to do what we need him to do. Matthew 15, 32 and following, Jesus, when he saw the multitude had followed him and they were fainting out in the wilderness, he said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to feed them all. Now, I don't have any bread trucks or bakery stores around, so you gather up what bread and fishes you can find and I'll multiply them supernaturally. God is active. 
I mean, in, in the smallest ways, the scriptures encourage us. Take Matthew 17, the end of that chapter there. He's concerned about Peter's concern. Peter answered rashly one time when someone asked him, does your teacher pay taxes? He said, yes. And when he got back to the house, he said, well, do we? <laughs> Jesus said, yes, we do. Well, where's the money? Go down to the sea. The first fish that you catch, pull him up, open his mouth. In it, you'll find a coin. And so that the heathen don't stumble, go and pay our taxes for us. How do you like that? He didn't have to tell us a story like that. Such a small, just a coin in a fish's mouth. But he tells us to show how God is so active in this world. He knows what's in the mouth of all the fishes and all the seas. And maybe even put some of those things in their mouth as well. So eminence, let me conclude tonight, we're just about out of time, teaches us that God is aware of what's going on, but he's both present and active in the affairs of both nature and man. He is aware, he is concerned, he is presently working through all primary and secondary causes and events to bring about his own sovereign will and purpose. Things aren't just working themselves out, as the heathens say. As Revelation teaches us, he is Alpha and Omega, first and last, the beginning and the ending. And because he is first and last, he spans everything in between. He's the Lord of history. And he is, wor he is working everything out to bring about his own sovereign will and purpose. He's not distant. He's not abstract. He's not remote, quote unquote, in the extreme transcendent sense. He's not without feeling. He's not without feeling. Rather, he is forgiving, loving, gracious, kind, tender, merciful, long-suffering, gentle. Whenever he passed before Moses, what did he say? I'm going to let all of my goodness pass before you. The Lord who is gentle, kind, long-suffering. God has no feelings. God has more feelings than we have. God is the creator of our feelings. He's the one who gave us the heart and the spirit and the psychology that we have in order to be people, not rocks and trees, and, and we have feelings, we have emotions. God has them as well. 